Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to the third and final lecture in the faculty talk series. This one is rescheduled from last spring during the COVID shutdown. And it's part of our very soon to end spring lectures, New Proximities, which was organized by our faculty student committee, including RDA Executive Director Maria Nicanor. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the committee chaired by Assistant Professor Brittany Udding and Wortham Fellow Anlin Ng for organizing the series and all the staff who assisted, particularly Christine Worley, our event specialist. On a program note, last week's postponed lecture by Hélène Frischaux is now set for 6 p.m. Monday, 19th April. And please also uh, join us for the spotlight uh, lecture on the uh, 14th of April and the RDA Civic Forum on the 21st. As I've previously mentioned, the impetus for these presentations was the realization that even in a small school like ours, now made even more apparent during these virtual times, many of us, particularly students, are not so familiar with faculty who have not taught them, nor with their specific research and professional activities. So in this sense, these are introductory lecture, lectures um, and the only opportunity for faculty to share their current work. As I also mentioned a few weeks ago in Troy's introduction, one of the great privileges of being in a leadership position in the school over a very long period of time is seeing the development of our young faculty, both in teaching um, and in their research, uh, particularly if, you, if you've had a hand in hiring them. But with Christopher, I have an even longer history that goes back to, um, I believe it was 1988, when I was on the admissions committee for the school with professors Spencer Parsons and Gordon Wittenberg, and came across Christopher's application for the undergraduate program. It stood out for its maturity in crafting a clear articulation about architecture's agency and why this was what he wanted to pursue. I was able to see firsthand the realization of the early promise a few years later when he was in my sophomore studio and after his preceptorship at Renzo Piano, I was fortunate to have him again, this time in my first niece traveling graduate option studio, where he built the most remarkable 12 foot long, six foot high study model of his project all in a weekend. And of course, in those days without laser cutters, 3D printers or CNC mills. To me, the ease and facility he displayed, not only in his model making skills, but more importantly in the way he transcribed his design from concept to reality, was what impressed me the most. After going to London to complete his PhD at the London Consortium, he went on to lead an experimental graduate unit at the AA where one day he and I had a memorable lunch at Conrad's Bluebird restaurant to seal the deal for his return to Houston to teach in a tenure track position. The rest, as they say, is history. So please help me uh, welcome our very own Christopher Height. Thanks, John. Um, and maybe I should blame you for the, the topic as well, uh, for the Nice studio. Um, uh, the topic of the global literals. I uh, maybe I've never uh, overcome the uh, the fascination with the coastal cities and coastlines and how one uh, manages these uh, uh, the forces that are unleashed on the coastal uh, line front, uh, whether one is talking about culture or nature. Yeah, so I titled the the lecture. It's the same title as last year. Um, the global littoral or global littorals could be plural either way. Um, and I'm going to use it to talk a little bit of, I'm not gonna talk so much about the work I've done at Rice o over the past however many years, um, but I, I will talk a little bit about it and um, 
a little bit about some uh, more recent research and experiences in Buenos Aires as, uh, and hopefully begin to examine, you know, some of the larger sort of broader issues that might be at stake. Um, when I, when I think about the, the littoral, the littoral is the coastline, right, of the, uh, of any region, the, the, where, the place where the land meets the sea. And the global littoral for me also has always evoked this map uh, by Buckminster Fuller. It's one of his uh, maps of the Dymaxion world. And the amazing thing about the, the uh, Dymaxion world map that Fuller created um, is because it's on a kind of geodesic uh, projection. One could, the way you can cut and unfold that map um, in various ways. And so he would create various different versions of reading the world uh, according to that. And one of them is the one continent uh, map. And um, which I think uh, really captures what's at stake in the global littoral. It's to see the world in a way from the, in this case, projected from the center of the North Pole, not as seven continents, but as a single chain of islands, of archipelagos that are linked together. Um, and you can almost see it as almost a singular coastline, uh, perhaps uh, except for uh, 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 Antarctica and, uh, and Australia at the, at the very ends. But almost always, you, know, you, could you could trace these lines with almost never listing, lifting your pen. Um, and so that's one idea of a kind of a, a, a new idea of the global of the global coastline. Um, the other idea is um, the, the littoral as a shared interface in a world of climate change and sea level rise, and uh, as well as global as economic globalization and, and uh, social cultural globalization. And so uh, I tend to think of it also as a kind of uh, uh, it's an infra ontology, and so maybe we'll unpack that a little bit. Um, and so the first reading of the littoral, the littoral also is often understood and or sort of is used in military and strategic uh, discourses, the littoral, which is a you know, coastal defense. And we still think of it that way, I think, when we talk about uh, climate change oftentimes, right? This is a map of the world um, with where south is up just to uh, uh, think about it in a different way, um, where it shows all of the areas at risk due to climate change. Now at this scale, you know, it's just an, it, it looks like it's a map of the entire planet. And I think that tells us something. Uh, the thickness of the line uh, generally shows how, how much of the territory uh, is uh, at risk due to sea level rise and, and other, some other factors of climate change. So here, I think is a nice architectural uh, uh, disciplinary map where line thickness uh, no longer equals uh, material, but uh, threat to material. Um, but this is this kind of, uh, uh, you can see how much of it is, is at stake. Um, of course, the urbanization that the world, the unprecedented urbanization that's occurred over the last uh, 100 years, uh, and especially in the last 50 years, has occurred mostly along the coastlines. And these are the territories that are most at risk. Um, and so this is the other uh, global littoral. And so when we think of, and when we think about it, right, um, what building seawalls and so on, we're thinking about global, and we're thinking about, you know, coastal defense. That's the term that is often used for infrastructures like seawalls. And so uh, one, I guess, always has in uh, one's mind, at least I do, um, this idea of the, the littoral as a frontier, uh, as a place where, uh, one can one uh, one creates constructs to fend off uh, uh, aggression, uh, sometimes of uh, uh, of a, another army, sometimes of nature. Uh, these are photographs of uh, from Paul Virilio's book Bunker Archaeology, in which he um, documented the um, bunkers that were constructed. Um, along the uh, along along the French uh, coastline um, uh, and uh, just documenting these towers uh, upon this horizon. Um, and there's a quote by JG Ballard um, that talks about you know his ex his own experience encountering these uh, these bunkers constructed via by the Third Reich to defend its newly occupied territory. 
um, and the and and these holding holding a long and vast line through these points. And so I think there's it's always I think the littoral is often uh, effused with these kind of ideas of of the fence. I also think um, it's that's useful to think about in terms of uh, even today's popular culture and conversations about ecology, sustainability, and climate change. Um, in the post-war period, um, science fiction films were often, you know, uh, sort of uh, employed as ways of uh, uh, parsing through anxieties around the Cold War, uh, whether it's War of the Worlds or many other uh, many other films, where Martians uh, are, are are sort of take play the role of a Russian invader or another communist invader. And so, you know, the Martians are Russians invading from another land. They tend not to arrive at the coast. They arrive, you know, through, uh, through the atmosphere from space. Uh, but there they arrive and, and they're uh, attacking our, um, they're attacking American soil. Um, and more recently, um, I think this, uh, this is, sort of replayed, uh, I think, in, in some uh, more recent science fiction, especially in, uh, for example, The Martian, the both the book, but especially the film, in which, you know, The Martian is no longer a quote-unquote foreign invader, but uh, The Martian is oneself. And in this, if Martians were once the foreign invaders into uh, the United States or onto the earth, now, right, the, 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 there's no you're at, Mars itself has become the Earth, right? And and Matt Damon, uh, you know, all American Bostonian boy, is uh, us, right? And so the enemy is no longer from without and invading, but it is within. Um, and uh, it speaks to these kind of even the even the uh, uh, film poster with the clouds and the storms, you know, the dusk the. Uh, sandstorm arising on the horizon and this lone lone figure walking uh amidst the the landscape i think speaks to this kind of a sense that uh we are now in hostile territory um and you know and this uh, kind of meme which i thought was kind of funny that uh, science will save us fear my botany powers now now uh, uh science is our defense or maybe infrastructure um and uh, I think this is a kind of uh, transformation where we're re returning to a familiar story, but that story has almost been turned inside out, upside down. Um, and I think that is how we kind of understand it. Here is a couple of maps. One um, is, a, is a projection for the predicted coastlines based on different levels of carbon emissions, because that influences how much uh, we could predict sea level to rise um, in the NASA Clear Lake region near us, um, and you can see uh, how how it uh, how much of the land is indeed threatened. So what everything that was stable right is now in question, or and this has already occurred uh, in different ways and for different slightly different reasons in other places nearby. Uh, here is a few satellite photos of the. Uh, collapse of the Mississippi Delta um, um, and due to dredging, urbanization, and climate change around it. And you can see the land literally disappear uh, within a human, you know, really within a human lifespan. Um, it is quite amazing. This is still the most rapidly disappearing landscape in the world, uh, the Mississippi Delta uh, region. The other way I think uh, discourses of defense and, and uh, protection emerge is um, another formulation that sort of always plays in the back of my mind recently. Uh, and I guess it would be, I, I call it the Rumsfeldian epistemology um, as told by Slavoj Zizek. And uh, Zav Slavoj Zizek has a, a very kind of pithy and, and humorous, but I think also useful uh, kind of schematization that he draws from Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and his uh, press briefing, uh, his famous press briefing, when he when he says, you know, there are things that we know, there are things we know we don't know, there are things we don't know we don't know, right? Um, but as Slavoj Zizek points out, uh, Rumsfeld left out the fourth term, which Zizek said is that the fourth version of that, the fourth the, the fourth combination, um, which Zizek says is the most important. 
and that is the unknown knowns. Uh, in other words, as Zizek puts it, all the unconscious beliefs, prejudices that determine how we perceive reality and intervene in it. Right. Um, in other words, right, um, all those things that we forgot that we know, those things which in a way, in a way allow us, or allow what we know to exist. Uh, they allow our knowledge, but we forget the basis upon which that knowledge uh, is sort of uh, uh, precariously balanced. Um, and so I think that's, a, I think in many ways when I'm looking at climate change and especially in terms of how design, whether one thinks about it as urban design or architectural design, engages these very broad and very real and, and increasingly um, um, pressing uh, issues, how does also one employ this as a way of project of, of question of almost remembering the uh, knowns that we've unknown uh, and therefore projecting into the unknown unknowns. Uh, which I think is at the end of the day, our job in many ways as architects, um, not to solve the problem, but to project into that unknown unknowns and to actually and, and precipitate it into one of the other three, I guess. Um, so that constant process of, of uh, sort of deterritorializing what we know, what our known territories of knowledge are and the way we understand our, understand our literal territories of operation. And then, uh, to uh, find new ways of engaging it. Um, and I also, we all, I always, also always look at these coastal defense systems as infrastructures of power um, that they, they help, they participate and have participated and will participate in the construction of a social realm and uh, raise, and in the age of uh, sea level rise, the question of what will our societies be and how do we live uh, how do we literally live upon the coastline and who are we? Uh, how, what is our self-identity? Uh, so here's, uh, here's a, some photos of uh, one of the levees that broke during Hurricane Katrina and the reconstructed levees. This is from a tour I took uh, with some a studio uh, the semester after that occurred. And you can just, you know, you can see the, you know, the precarious situation with the water level up here and then uh, down here, and so these are right, these are these are as much social and political questions as they are technological or scientific. Um, and it also has a lot to do, I think, with our identities. This is uh, uh, two images of the seawall in Galveston. One is the kind of technical image of the seawall being constructed. Uh, Galveston famously wiped out in a 1900 storm. Uh, until 1900, Galveston was the most important city in all in Texas. It was the only city that counted, really. It was the, called the Wall Street of the South. Um, it was destroyed in the 1900 storm, um, and uh, which allowed Houston to sort of usurp its uh, Galveston's role. But I think this postcard of um, the seawall is uh, telling the great seawall at Galveston an image of a reconstruction of a sort of uh, a, a fable uh, hemmed in by this, uh, this concrete line in the sand um, that allows this kind of human, uh, perhaps all too human world of uh, ant the antebellum uh, South in a way to, to persist uh, amidst an otherwise threatening territory. So I think there's also um, those kinds of ideas. These are these are views of um, uh, this is an image of what that of what Galveston looked like af immediately after the 1900 storm. The little inset image, I know it's blurry. This, the image itself, the photo, the original photograph is blurry. Um, is what the is taken from roughly the same point of view uh, where you can actually see a city, and now all you can only see a debris field. Um, the stories of the 1900 storm include a harrowing. Uh, recounts by eyewitnesses um, where the, the few who did survive, where the storm surge would ground up the first couple rows of the buildings, and then they formed a, a wall of debris that would then grind up all the buildings behind it as the storm slowly pushed, pushed the debris into 
uh, further inland. And so you could, you would hear uh, the eyewitnesses would hear the kind of grinding sound. It was almost like a, I think it was like a hundred locomotives slowly grinding the city to a pulp. So architecture turned against itself. That seawall, of course, right, has on the one hand allowed Galveston to exist um, and surviving the, uh, the number of storms uh, that we have had in the last 100 years, 120 years since, and will continue to have at an increasing rate, but does so only by forgetting, right, uh, one of the unknown knowns that the land is continually shifting and will continually shift and everything um, is and and the, the attempt to stabilize the land uh, requires uh, an incredible uh, investment of energy uh, to stabilize it and uh, and it required it not just once but over and over again and the seawall of course is one of those many infrastructures that is uh, increasingly uh, its lifespan is going to be uh, cut rather short by sea level rise and will no longer function. And these are just images of how these sea level, you know, the, the coastlines always change and always will change. And we can attempt to arrest them by uh, inputting uh, more energy into the system to stay, to, to stop its movement for a period of time, but it will, it will return to that. And we're, so we sort of, uh, to create our little, uh, islands of civilization uh, um, th that are stable bubbles within this kind of torrent. Um, we still, right, are dealing with the same kind of factor. And I thought this image of uh, the Boulevard Peninsula, which is just north of Galveston uh, after Hurricane Ike was kind of amazing where the entire peninsula is erased, except for this one little house, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, um, and then, of course, it's reoccupied um, and it's even more compromised. Uh, and I think this kind of return to continually trying to reconstruct a home uh, on, this, on, on, the, on the sand is a kind of interesting uh, pathology, I guess we have. Um, as far back as 1962, J.G. Ballard, the writer J.G. Ballard, once again, wrote a uh, novel in his, when he was still very much a sci-fi genre writer um, called The Drowned World, in which he depicts London um, being uh, inundated uh, by water, um, absolutely. Like most, and in the, in the novel, almost every city um, in, uh, uh, had, and this had occurred in almost every city except for a few, I think in the north uh, and the extreme south. Um, of the world, and most everybody had fled or been killed by by the floods. It's not entirely clear what causes this to happen, but it is obviously some sort of environmental catastrophe and calamity. Uh, and the story, uh, the narrative of the story, uh, takes place within this flooded, uh, drowned world. Um, and uh, it's sort of, you know, it's a standard kind of genre detective plot. They're tracking, they're trying to track, uh, it's almost like a, like a Conrad Hearts of Darkness the theme. They're trying to track people and uh, usual narratives, uh, human narratives are, are playing forth. But the mo one of the more interesting things about the novel is as, uh, as this uh, human drama, uh, how the events of the human drama, as, as the events of the human drama occur uh, during the book, the, the narrative itself uh, becomes sort of disintegrates a little bit in front of your eyes as one reads it. And, and that tracks the protagonists in the novel uh, begin to devolve um, over, over the course of the novel. Uh, and by the end of the novel, all the spoiler alert, uh, the novelist, uh, the, uh, the, the main, uh, characters had become, had returned to some sort of, uh, proto reptilian, uh, state, um, uh, almost like, like a new crocodiles or something, planet of the crocodiles. Um, and with this idea that the, the, with the drowning of the world of humanity in a way, this anthropomorphic world, uh, humans themselves begin to um, sort of have experienced an epigenesis and sort of devolve or actually I don't know, evolve um, into another kind of animal. And I think there's this, um, there's, for me, there's always this question uh, uh, that 
uh, in all this work is not to preserve this the literal dom uh, domain of humanity, right? Uh, but also, I mean, on the one hand, we want to protect our, our cities, of course, but to do it in a way that uh, expands our understanding of what it is to be a human uh, and, and certainly outside a kind of anthropocentric uh, worldview. Uh, to become sort of post-human in some ways, at least post-humanist, where we understand that we are not, that the, the human-centric worldview and that kind of uh, the ethos that comes with it is no longer available. And so, that, again, the sort of unknown knowns uh, to uh, 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 dismantle those. So I think there's always a kind of idea there. Um, I'll, I'm going to talk... Uh, in some ways, it's a tale of two cities. Um, I've done uh, research, much research and writing, and and we've I've run studios for for years on you know the Gulf Coast conditions, uh, whether it's um, uh, the bayous and the infrastructures around them in Houston or Galveston itself. Uh, in the past couple of semesters, well, one semester uh, of sabbatical before the. Uh, 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 the, uh, the lockdowns prevented all travel. Uh, I, I, I visited um, Buenos Aires in Argentina um, and uh, sort of took some of what I had uh, examined in the Gulf Coast and, and looked at this other kind of parallel city. So it's kind of a tale of two cities um, of how of how this how these you know there we have specific. Uh, Every city along the global littoral has specific problems. Uh, many also share uh, similar issues. And I, strangely enough, Houston and the Gulf Coast have many kind of points of coincidence with Buenos Aires and its coastal condition in uh, the Rio de Plata. Um, the Buenos Aires coastline, uh, the coastline around Buenos Aires is a completely constructed condition like most coastlines are. Um, and it's extremely literal, right? Uh, if Galveston was basically reconstructed from the ground up after it was erased, right? It was the original Galveston was one of the you know, uh, great modernist uh, urban projects to build a tabula rasa, uh, to build a new city upon a tabula rasa. Um, Buenos Aires also is that kind of city. Um, it's, uh, here's a photograph of the uh, coastal landscape being uh, filled in the construction of levees and dikes uh, and then uh, beginning to fill in that landscape with uh, debris and the entire land uh, coastline of Buenos Aires is um, is all landfill uh, and has been reconstructed over time here are some images of Buenos Aires and a couple diagrams um, the um, it's all, uh, it's almost all of the coastline is under extreme threat from climate change, uh, something that they're actually kind of in denial about. Uh, I don't want to even say they're in denial, it hasn't quite uh, entered the, 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 even the, the realm of anxiety in a kind of conscious way yet. Um, and that shows, you know, these, the two charts show uh, possible, uh, uh, sea level rise changes in Buenos Aires and Stockholm, for example, as just two examples of, uh, of where we are. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about uh, uh, these two, this comparison is even if uh, the emission scenarios, the, the, so they have different emission scenarios and obviously the, um, the more emissions are cut, um, the, the, the less impact there is. So the sort of lines at the bottom are, are, are based on lower emissions uh, from between 2000 and 2100. Um, and you'll notice in Stockholm, if one cuts the emissions, uh, it actually, you know, the, uh, the, you know, it gets better, right? Um, and, the, and the sea level rise has been kind of dropping anyway. Um, in Buenos Aires, no matter what one does, Right. Uh, no matter how much emissions are cut, or if nothing is done, they are still facing some pretty significant issues uh, going into the future. The sea level has been rising, in general, um, throughout the 20th century, as you can see, a kind of the kind of way the the, the tides are rising, and uh, they do have seawalls in Buenos Aires. They are already 
um, um, uh, exceeded the capacity of the seawalls are exceeded already at least twice a decade. There aren't uh, quite, a, there, it's not extreme flooding like we experience here yet, uh, but uh, it's probably a matter of time. Uh, and you can see the kind of, uh, and you can see the, the areas that are most at risk, um, including the historic core of Buenos Aires itself here in the center. Um, and you know, these, uh, there's many examples of uh, these kinds of, uh, this is by uh, the client group called Climate Central. You can pick any city you want and, and find out how, uh, how much the city will, might flood in the future based on different climate emissions. Um, and they have a few animations of some of those cities. And this is one of Buenos Aires that shows uh, how, how uh, great the uh, potential cata catastrophe is based on different levels of uh, temperature change. Um, and I will also say that these models tend to be optimistic uh, in my, I mean, they're very rough and ready. Uh, they basically, you know, they tend to take the sea level rise, they take a eustatic sea level rise and apply it to a contour map and, uh, and raise the water level more or less. Uh, in fact, it could be far worse, uh, or it could be uh, just as bad in very different ways for many cities, including Buenos Aires. Because of course, climate change, it just, it's not just that sea level rises, but there are other climatic effects and um, there are other uh, envir uh, environmental and climatological effects that are going on. And for example, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the economic drivers uh, of the Buenos Aires, of the Argentinian economy, such as it's been, and it's been quite disastrous over the past uh, decade, but one of the only growth points has been real estate development where land is transformed right uh, into real estate and that is occurring in wetlands and and uh, flood floodways um, and in otherwise this very arable um, moist landscape that surrounds surrounds Buenos Aires and is quite uh, you know agriculturally quite productive and useful but the landscape is being hardened and transformed into suburban developments, which of course increases the potential uh, for flooding, not from the sea, but from inland. And so even if sea level rise doesn't, doesn't go up as much, uh, that they're, they are, they are already experiencing increasing inland flooding um, within the city itself. So when it, and so I think, you know, this has continually been, kind of stake, right? So uh, Buenos Aires has always been a kind of site of um, colonialist imagination. Um, there's an image of Pedro de Mendoza uh, founding the port of Buenos Aires, and you can see the, uh, the obelisk, the sort of plinth that has been uh, placed into the ground to uh, formalize the ownership of Spain uh, uh, over the, you know, of the natives uh, in, in this photograph, the indigenous peoples, which were uh, conquered, conquered and then subsequently eradicated. Um, uh, it's a kind of classic image of, of Pedro. He became the first conquist, he became the first governor of the region. And you can see the first thing that is done is fortification of that land, of, of, the, of the coast, right? Um, against uh, against those who are already there. Um, so this kind of colonial act with, again, the kind of projection, right, of uh, European city ordered uh, image of, of reason in terms of the grid uh, imposed upon the uh, uh, kind of what was seen and described as a primordial landscape. Uh, and so the, the grids of reason must be uh, imposed upon it and then protected uh, and through the citadel, which also forms the interface. In the image, you can also see uh, the geomorphology of the, of the area um, where the, the, you have the water at the bottom and then one line which shows roughly where the shoreline was. And then this top line shows uh, a sort of shelf um, where, where it was a, uh, the landscape, uh, 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 there's a little hill that becomes higher and most of the city is placed on top of this kind of plateau. Um, it's a bit of, it's actually a bit of the seabed or the riverbed kind of comes up and forms the kind of plateau 
uh, and the space between the space between this uh, and this map, what's the water line and that kind of new kind of cliff side um, is the space that become is transformed over the next uh, you know 200 years uh, into uh, the site of exchange. Buenos Aires was uh, ideally suited um, because it was about um, it was about as far in as the ships of the time could navigate into uh, the Rio de Plata, which is the sort of inlet from the um, uh, from the ocean uh, up into the Parana and um, uh, the Parana River uh, and uh, the Uruguay River, which are these two major rivers. Um, the Parana River is the second largest river in South America, uh, and you can see it. It, it it moves deep into the center of the continent. And so it was incredibly important both uh, for trade, but also um, imperial expansion as a, as a way um, uh, during the uh, period of colonization. And Buenos Aires is placed right here uh, at the mouth of two of, of those two rivers uh, and becomes an incredibly you know, and strategically important place. And it's about as far up as you could navigate. Uh, with the ships of the time. It's still that today. It's still placed in a very, the, the river is still a very important um, uh, economic and cultural uh, sort of freeway in the water, uh, deep into the heartland of the continent, um, and also tying uh, uh, the countries uh, to the inland into a global system of, of shipping and trade. Um, by the middle of the 19th century, uh, that territory uh, between the waters, the old water's edge and uh, the plateau of the city uh, had been transformed into docks uh, and uh, 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 shipping ports, um, uh, as you can see here, uh, had already been uh, extensively transformed. You can see how long some of these uh, piers are. That's an indication of how shallow the water is. The water is incredibly shallow, and we'll still see in a minute. And so one of the other things that occurs over time is the reshaping of this coastal area, not only sort of say in plan, but also in section to make the waters deeper and to actually allow, you know, really pushing the land out into the sea uh, in order to allow the ships to dock and to create and gain efficiency. By 1900, there was an incredible uh, influx of European immigrant, immigrants into um, into the city, um, and it became really a, a sub, many different, right, subsequent, uh, you know, many different uh, uh, nations uh, occupied and immigrated into Buenos Aires, and it took this kind of overlay of all of those different waves of immigration uh, as they occurred uh, over time, and then so it becomes, the city itself becomes this an amazing place where um, uh, uh, the overlay from, you know, Spain, Italy, France, and England, in English kind of cultures and waves of immigrants sort of, uh, arrive and transform the city into kind of uh, uh, echoes or uh, reflections of, um, you know, uh, Spanish urbanism, French urbanism, uh, and so on and so forth. And each the city takes each each one of these uh, kind of overlays. And the city itself has these kind of amazing qualities that I haven't figured out a way to document, where you can walk through the city and it seems like you're in one kind of you know seems like you're almost like in a 19th century Paris. And you turn the corner and all of a sudden you're in a completely different city. You turn another corner and you're in a third city. Uh, and the city changes abruptly as, as uh, over time, uh, but it changes abruptly as one moves through it as the, you know, in some, in some ways that tracks onto time uh, as, the, as the city has developed. Um, here you can see uh, in the bottom, this is, you know, this is where um, the central train station, and this is all in that landfill area. So all of these immigration ports um, and uh, were, were built in that kind of coastal zone. And today that coastal zone still exists as the port, but this also where all the transport occurs. And you can see how flat and low it is. The Rio de Plata itself, one of the reasons it was so important ecologically in a different way, um, is that it was also... Um, uh, it's 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 been it's been a significant ecological basin, um, you know, for eons. 
uh, here is the Rio, the, the, the Rio de Plata had existed, um, has existed for a long time, even when there was uh, all the continents actually were um, uh, still joined. And here you can see upside down, uh, uh, South America is upside down here. And you can see the Rio de Plata here. And of course, this Buenos Aires is right at the mouth of this and the, the, uh, the oval is the basin for the Rio de Plata. And you can see it's one of the significant uh, river basins of the world um, dating very far back in the ge in geological history uh, through time. And it also uh, it has some amazing, uh, because the, it was so adjacent to uh, the Kalahari region of Africa or even the Congo Craton, which then overlaps um, into South America. Here it has it has a kind of incredibly important role in um, the sort in the evolution, well the geological transformations, but also the evolutionary uh, history um, uh, over time. This is um, to go back to the construction of the coast. This is uh, an image of of the fortification of that of the of the Rio de Plata itself. Uh, and the and the transformation of that into a you know, into a navigable uh, well an interface for trade and capital uh, you can see the the land here which is you know sort of the natural state the construction of a uh, wooden fortification and the and the initial and the frameworks for that so from constructing a seawall and how the this line right was slowly transformed into a series of docks and wharfs uh, to uh, for trade. Um, which is again all necessary because it is incredibly shallow. The there are apocryphal stories that one on a good day could almost walk from uh, walk across the Rio de Plata Bay uh, from uh, to the other side uh, to um, Uruguay. I, I didn't try that. I, I mean, I, you have to be very tall, I think, to pull it off. You actually just sink into the mud. But it is incre it is incredibly shallow, um, not unlike Galveston Bay. Um, and so um, it makes it incredibly rich uh, ecologically and important ecologically, um, but it also you know, creates issues for navigation. And so the bay is slowly transformed over time. Unlike say the example I showed earlier of the Mississippi Delta, the uh, area around uh, the Rio de Plata is in a state of collapse. Um, I mean, sorry, the Mississippi Delta is in a state of collapse. The area around uh, Buenos Aires is still growing uh, currently. The, it's the, the, the uh, delta has been increasing. Uh, it's not entirely sure how long that will occur. Um, and so by, you know, by the 19th century, this domain had been uh, filled in and transformed into the kind of Buenos Aires one sees today, um, where um, uh, this is taken roughly at the same points of view. Um, but from opposite, you know, so this is the river uh, here that you see here, right? So it's, this, is, this is taken, say, from the north, uh, and this is taken from the south. Um, and you can see the ports. You can see, the, however, how the landscape has been transformed over time and the, and the sites reconstructed. This, uh, this canal here, right, is still, it still exists, and it's here. And this is what it looks like now. It's been turned into Puerto Madero, which is one of the newer developments in the city, um, finished uh, around 2017. Uh, you can see the gleaming skyscrapers on the one side and the old wharfs um, and warehouses turned into uh, luxury condominiums. And of course, it, you know, it's replete with a Calatrava bridge, a uh, sign of gentrification if there ever was one. Immediately adjacent to that, uh, or just um, you know, a half quarter mile upstream is uh, one, the, one of the villas, uh, which are the kind of favelas, the mass of slums that occur in Buenos Aires. The most famous one is Villa 31. It's, it's right here. And, it's, and you can see it's occupying that landfill area. You can see the, the, the port, the, major, the main port for the city uh, on the upper left, right? And you can see the main city on the upper right, right? And if you remember that very first map, right? Of the sea of the water's edge and the city where the city on a kind of plateau, everything here is built between that and that zone. You can see how low it is. Um, all these zones are liable for flooding. And in fact, 
do already. Um, this is another villa farther down uh, in a Daksud area that is uh, regularly uh, flooded. Um, um, in fact, as the ports expand and there are, there are, there's ongoing expansion occurring already to try to compete with Uruguay, it's exacerbating the flooding in these neighborhoods. Um, these are all informal settlements. Um, and there's a real question about what happens to them. And so there's still this kind of uh, uh, political and cultural uh, interplay going on. The littoral is also, of course, always one of these sites of a kind of uh, what I would call an endo-colonial ecology today. At one point, it was the site, if it was the site of sort of colonial expansion and imagination at one point, today it's also, it continues to do that in a kind of uh, post-colonial world of globalization, but there's also other kinds of transformations uh, that are ongoing. Um, they are the kind of uh, interface for global trade and industrial production, right? And the car of the carbon economy, they are all, they are also the sites increasingly where, uh, even at the microscopic scales, the ecologies are being being affected by those very same uh, economic and industrial uh, uh, networks. Um, this is uh, some a map uh, done for Galveston, for example, uh, of showing um, the amount of ballast water that is exchanged uh, in Galveston, uh, both for cargo and oil, over a period of time. Um, you know, so the ships as they come in and out uh, 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 take on different amounts of ballast water based on how full their cargo is, how much cargo they have to maintain, to be maintain stability. Um, this happens all over the world, of course. And as this is happening, the world's uh, uh, ports are becoming more and more similar uh, ecologically because when you release the ballast water, you also release all this micro, micro flora and fauna into the water streams. Um, and so the water, these coastal waters are literally becoming kind of globalized at the micro scale as well as the macro scale. Um, and uh, this churns up all of this territory, and it's happening in uh, in in, uh, in Buenos Aires as well as Galveston, of course. A um, question of how one manages that is always an issue. The ongoing dredging that's necessary because for the expansion of the ports um, also uh, radicalizes the kind of uh, 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 the the mobilization of sort of micro sediments and uh, microflora and fauna uh, in, in the areas. Um, the entire region has to be dredged continually. Um, and that amount of dredge is increasing to maintain all these waterways in an alluvial situation. Um, already today, enough material is dredged in the Rio de Plata and Piranha Estuary to fill up 22 Empire State Buildings or cover Central Park with 10 feet of mud every year. Um, this is set to double. Uh, due to expansions of the canals and waterways uh, for trade. And the impacts of climate change uh, means one will go up even further uh, exponentially. Um, there's massive investment every year uh, in the construction of new kind of territories everywhere, uh, what to do with this waste material of the mud to maintain the waterways, uh, sometimes producing these kind of amazingly strange abstract patterns, in this case, just in the area around Houston. Um, uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, it's used to fill in these uh, little islands within the delta itself, creating uh, kind of moats uh, and um, uh, you know, thousands of little archipelagos that, uh, that are clung to and then occupied for various uh, strange leisure and, uh, uh, and uh, sort of resort communities. Uh, also, of course, the they're used for the construction of uh, artificial wetlands, uh, these kinds of, uh, as well, these kinds of strange uh, new territories um, um, where uh, not designed primarily for human habitats, but for uh, you know, bird hat, bird sanctuaries, but also do form an important kind of new interface and can protect coastlines. But they also are these kind of strange, uh, kind of beautifully strange places and habitats. Um, and so this, uh, um, and, and so this, you know, the, the, the coastal area of Buenos Aires is filled with these 
kind of transformations um, as well, and is continually constructed and reconstructed as a coastline. Um, that everything that one, even stuff that looks green and natural, nothing is natural. It's all kind of, uh, uh, it's all an infrastructure. Um, and this, and the transformation of these territories into infrastructures and infrastructuralization, I think is a kind of important idea. Um, and as like Houston, the dredge material is this kind of uh, uh, excess that has to be managed and transformed and has great potential uh, to also produce these other kind of habitats. And in fact, you know, find ways of that land, if whether it's to whether it's for uh, habitats, but also as uh, other types of coastal defenses, um, uh, to create a productive landscape that is not real estate. All right, there's other ways of of, uh, of monetizing the usefulness of of this mud, um, besides the the transformation of wetlands into real estate. Um, and so, for me, the the, you know, I think whether one is talking about the Gulf Coast or whether one is talking about uh, the coastline of the Rio de Plata and Buenos Aires, um, it, to me, it, it operates as this dynamic zone in which the uh, sort of culture of the 21st century uh, is, is the sort of crucible of the 21st century. The philosopher Peter Sloterdijk has described, you know, it has used the metaphor, the very architectural metaphor, the greenhouse, uh, to describe um, um, a sort of uh, you know the European uh, democratic project um, and this ideal of a cosmopolitan city, uh, cosmopolitan society in the 20th century, uh, in which you know all these, uh, which is itself a kind of European colonial project. Of course, the greenhouse is itself a kind of colonial project, where all of the different uh, uh, species of plants are gathered from around the world and then uh, share uh, a kind of a benign uh, habitat, like a, a benign climate uh, housed underneath this, uh, this uh, mediated uh, and this mediated uh, temperate environment and the different uh, and the greenhouses. Um, and it's kind of a metaphor for cosmopolitan society for, for Sloterdijk. Uh, if that's so, then the kind of, uh, uh, I think the, the coastlines um, and the sort of uh, infrastructures around those coastlines and their continual uh, reconstruction, uh, deconstruction and reconstruction are kind of the less benign and more dynamic and, and uh, more ambiguous territories and uh, through which a kind of uh, a different kind of um, uh, cosmopolitanism might be possible uh, around, uh, around the issues of climate change and transformation. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, um, John, for the applause and thank you, Chris, for your lecture. <laughs> Still need a laugh track. To, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to remind attendees that there is a Q&A at the bottom of the screen and they can submit questions there. Where do I, where do I see? And um, so I'll just start um, in your presentation. And it was full of like new kinds of maps and ways of representing known geographies. And I'm wondering if um, the act of map making is important to the work that's produced in your studios. Uh, yes, I sure want to show a lot of it, uh, but um, we do, we do a lot of map making. Um, and um, when we approach the maps, I would, I approach the maps as, um, I guess, in the, in the way that uh, Gilles Deleuze uh, had once described maps as uh, maps, not as tracings, right? Not as documentation, documentation of what's already there, or I guess the known knowns. Um, but uh, maps is a way of producing a, maps as diagrams of potential relationships as well as what's, you know, uh, potential relationships and moreover the forces that have constructed the condition that one sees. And so, um, you know, utilizing the maps as a kind of uh, instrument of abstraction 
uh, as much as documentation uh, in which uh, that then can lead to uh, sort of a transformation of those territories. Um, so they're sort of uh, used in a very kind of projective way um, to understand, you know, how those things are occurring. I also think maps are important because it sort of it takes the terrain and it turns it into a matter of disciplinary, it, makes, it turns it into a disciplinary object by transforming it into lines, right? <laughs> and even the uh, process of on the, you know, working with uh, existing conventions for how one draws a line or makes a, delineates territory, um, and then finding the and then sometimes one encounters limits for those, especially when you're talking about very transformative and, and fluid conditions, um, becomes also a kind of disciplinary um, uh, tool both for um, you know so on the one hand it turns it into a, a kind of object of disciplinary knowledge and on the other hand it can also serve as a motor for uh, the inno uh, innovation and, and, and transformation and expansion of those disciplinary boundaries as well so I think it uh, sort of works and it works as a kind of very concrete uh, device to uh, transform the boundaries of knowledge as well as uh, allow us to engage with our the specificity of our knowledge within these kind of often uh, uh, other you know the, the the issues of that concern other fields as well. Our next question comes from Jimmy Willis, and he asks: Cities may have more access to technological or brute force means to maintain the status of the land as such, but it seems inevitable a line is drawn, cutting off the long stretches of occupied coastline between these more developed coastal cities. We can't maintain the entire global coastline, and I don't think you are saying we should, but how then do we think towards a cosmopolitanism that does not stop at the city limits, but includes smaller towns and settlements in between them? I don't think there's a single, I mean, obviously it depends. I mean, when, when one is, there's no single answer. Obviously every, um, one would have to examine the specificities of every, local condition. Um, I will say that on the other hand, at the same time, smaller settlements, especially, um, um, you know, this, this, they, uh, they have had to deal with fluctuating landscapes, you know, for eons, right? Well, for centuries at least. Um, and in some ways have been, you know, that have in, in the past been able, you know, have sort of responded to to that by getting up and moving um there you know it's been a it's been a little bit more of a it's not really nomadic but it's sort of a periodic nomadism right of relocating settlements as the as coastlines shift and transform um and and so i mean that occurred it, the 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 crisis of kind of you know, the, the real problem occurs when um you know, with actually densification right the urban with urbanization right those it becomes uh, rather impossible to uh move uh a kind of scale and there's also sort of a, you know a greater uh um inertia right i mean it's just it's just becomes a matter of scale and becomes impossible to relocate uh and so um you know fluctuating you know pop terror as fluctuating populational territory uh, becomes uh, impossible to map, you know, you, you can't have, you know, as the territory itself fluctuates, the populations can't fluctuate the way they occupy the territory in the same way. Um, at the same time, um, um, you know, one of the issues that have occurred, uh, in the, especially in the last, since the middle of the 20th century, um, uh, in many places has been, I guess what I would call like a, almost a suburbanization. Um, so my, my sort of response is kind of twofold that generally uh, intensification at points actually is a fairly decent strategy um, that, um, you know, you have uh, a, a amplification of, uh, of sort of a contrast between high density populace and you know, almost in zero density populations. Um, it's easier to man. It's uh, so it's manageable to fortify, and you know, uh, well, it's it's one can have you know a smaller area that's uh, uh, 
uh, can have some kind of defense and has a greater uh, has and can be kind of controlled in some way. Um, the the real problem is kind of the sort of low medium density, uh, which uh, tends to be very imperiled. Um, how that you know? So I think what one might be looking at is uh, you know an intense nodes, and then areas um, where of displaced populations. Uh, and I, it's uh, whether that where those populations go, do they go farther inland or are they, uh, do they, do they uh, move into the urbanized areas is actually, you know, I think one of, uh, it's an open question. And uh, so I think we'll be seeing, we'll, we will be seeing, I think certain uh, uh, migrations in, in, within, within, uh, within coastal regions. Uh, you already see it happening, but I think there'll be a kind of a refugees uh, kind of refugee condition uh, within uh, the coastal areas might some might become a kind of continual refugee uh, uh, camp in some ways as uh, as these events occur. Our next question comes from Scott Skipworth, and they ask: uh, For Dilla's potential relationships assemblage generate a machine in these coastal zones for favelas to participate in beneficial, pardon me, um, to participate in beneficial futures. Um, less to colonial greenhouses created by urban planners with best intentions in these zones. At the same time, we are at risk due to climate change that will need uh, protection planning for people without means to move from these areas. So would you say this is a key issue to consider for those of us in the designing and policy making professions? I mean, to, to talk about the Buenos Aires villas for a moment specifically, they, they occupy the essentially the least desirable quote unquote uh, areas of the city there's a reason they 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 are where they are um and it's 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 a very kind of clear economic uh, diagram and but they also tend to occupy these no man's lands uh, between infrastructures right and so like in this photograph you can see on the right the docks all right of the main port uh, and then on, I'm sorry, on the left, and then on the right, you can see the, you can barely see it, the uh, train sheds and the train lines, the rail yards, uh, you can see the train sheds up in the upper, uh, upper right here um, for the freight and, and passenger trains. And so they, the Villa 31 occupies this long, and you can even see the cargo container. Here's a cargo uh, container port. Uh, here and uh, the villas sort of uh, occupy these no man's lands between these uh, infrastructures, um, and so um, um, uh, they occupy the sort of forgotten uh, zones between infrastructural domains. Right. Um, on the other hand, these are also areas that are very likely to flood and prone to flooding, and they are at the most uh, greatest geohazard. Um, and can't and are not really cannot really withstand it um and so um it's a it's a uh oh and there's the here's the freeway and so they they occupy these 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 uh these zones these intermezzos between uh between the infrastructures um they're uh and, and so i and in a way the so one could see them, they're almost the territories that the villas, oper, that the, the villas o, o, occupy are sort of produced right, by these infrastructures, uh, the port, the freeway, the train stations, the train, train lines. Um, you know, it's, they're, it's, it, they're produced by these linear infrastructures as these kind of territories that are caught between and then occupied um, as, as uh, sort of refuge from um, for, uh, for those who can't afford to live in, you know, the city on the hill, literally over in the corner, um, they're produced by those territories. Um, they're, ter you know, they're produced by those infrastructural operations. Um, and so the, the social domain, the, the society of the villas, the social, con uh, the urbanism of the villas uh, is, is produced via these infrastructures as a byproduct, right, in many ways. Um, uh, and yet, uh, they are, they, and they find innovative ways of occupying these territories that are that were not imagined to be occupiable. Um, they're also often cut off from the city around it. The Villa 31, you can't really see it here, but the Villa 31, there's really only two ways in and out of it. 
Uh, and there's only two ways to be connected to the rest of the city because otherwise they're surrounded by, you know, high speed roads and container, container ports. Um, and so they have very limited access in and out of the city. And so it's also that story of, of their sort of, a, sort of an archipelago uh, within the city. Um, and as we know very well, the, when, you know, the infrastructures are also often sort of stop and start <laughs> um, uh, in ways that uh, uh, disproportionately affect uh, minorities, uh, lower income uh, populations in the cities. And this is especially true in Houston. Um, you know, when, when the bayous were transformed into um, drainage ways and channelized in the 1950s and 30s, it was, you know, what the debates, the, the debates about which ones would be channelized and which ones were channelized and where these channelizations stop were, um, were social and political uh, debates and, um, and, off, and really, uh, in many cases, racial are arguments um, more than they were, not just technical arguments, right? There's a reason Buffalo Bayou was not channelized. Uh, 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 the, the, not because the uh, Army Corps of Engineers thought it didn't need to be channelized, but because there was social and political pressure brought to bear to prevent it from happening. So there's, you know, these are, these are kind of, uh, there's aesthetic and uh, lifestyle and as well as cultural, racial and ethnic um, uh, overtones. And so one of the, one of the, one of the questions is how, how does, uh, you know, the role of the design participating in those uh, and how can these, how can the design of these systems actually, I think, um, become platforms where those debates actually are formulated and, um, you can see it as a as a site for the negotiation and and uh, um, um, a site for those political and social discourses um, uh, and operations, rather than simply the kind of uh, say utilizing um, uh, like a scientific or scientistic, I should call it, you know, instead of using sort of technical or scientific uh, uh, problems as uh, an alibi for uh, transforming a condition or producing one kind of infrastructure or another, uh, I think design enters as a way of, um, uh, as probably the, the ground that mediates between say, uh, on the one hand, expertise of, uh, of uh, whether it's scientific expertise or um, uh, economic imperatives and those kinds of demands and social political uh, 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 desire. And I think that's, uh, I think design operates as a, as a mediator within those territories um, and also uh, sort of can precipitate, well, at the same time, precipitating um, what, Bernard Latour calls matters of fact, things like, you know, climate change, sea level rise, which are matters of fact, but don't really, they're hard to, you know, they're, they're not matters of concern, as Bernard Latour says, because in many ways they're almost invisible, um, either because they, they're too vast or too small, either in terms of space or time for us to actually see in front of our eyes in some ways, or we forget, we tend to forget very quickly. Um, and I think design can, can be uh, one of the instruments through which, you know, sort of matters of facts can actually be delineated and take a kind of, uh, uh, can be figured quite literally um, as an object uh, of concern and as a matter of concern. So I think the de uh, design in its relationship to infrastructures is a way through which those, uh, that, uh, that multiplicity of uh, concerns, issues, and actors can uh, uh, are are can be engaged and and uh, can actually precipitate uh, a, a kind of social and cultural milieu rather than just sort of imposing a kind of uh, say economic model upon it. And so we have time for just one quick question from Danny Samuels, and he asks, "Are you working toward a book that I can put in my library?" <laughs> yeah, I have been. Uh, I, I think I have like problems. I have like four books, um, and I can't decide which one I want to do. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of am. Um, 
Um, but as I say, it's sort of like four books right now, and I'm not sure which one I I I really uh, uh, have quite rested on. Um, so hopefully soon. Um, I think so. Um, at this point, I'll pass it over to Dean Kasparian. Thank you, Chris. This was great. See you next week, everyone. Thanks a lot. <laughs>